Welcome to Rainhead Stories, where we talk to persons who return home after spending an extended amount of time abroad. This time we're talking to Dr. Savannah Lloyd, who's from Jamaica and spent some time in Japan. And now she's back in Jamaica and we're talking to her today to learn more about her experiences away and at home. So, hi! Hey, uh, <laughs> um, also, Dr. Lloyd is a colleague of mine at the University of the West Indies, so she's also um, a faculty member where she teaches uh, physics, specifically uh, material science and electronics courses. Well, he really is smart, okay? Here he is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Alright, so first of all, we want to talk about baby Savannah. We want to talk about young Savannah in Jamaica, oh, that was oh, like growing up. Okay. Um, wait, in three words first, tell me what growing up in Jamaica meant to you. What it meant to me? Um, like as a kid or just... Yeah, or no, like reflecting, like what was mm. growing up like in Jamaica in three words. In three words. Mm -hmm. Um, fun, mm -hmm. educational, uh, growing. Nice, yeah. Okay, so tell me more, tell me more about growing up in Jamaica. Um, Oh, sorry. Um, I mainly grew up with my mom and my stepdad. My dad was very much in the picture, but my my mom married my stepdad when I was very young. Mm -hmm. um, so I grew up with them. Mm -hmm. um, we came to Kingston and then we moved to Spain and then back to Kingston. Lots of lots of stuff. I mean, Spain has been Spanish though. As in Spanish told okay, me. So Spain and Jamaica is sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. um, I went to Medivac. I was Peace Park, mm -hmm. then Medivac, mm -hmm. and then the University of the West Indies Ooh. before I went to Japan. So. I mean, I was, to be honest, I wasn't always an academic growing up, you know. Yeah, yeah when I was younger, I wanted to be on Broadway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean. I read that you danced, right? You danced? Yeah, I did. Mm -hmm. um, I was doing really semi professionally, mm -hmm. hoping to become a professional later in life. Mm -hmm. um, but my life was really much centered, was very much centered around my co curricular activities. I mean, school was there. Um, and it was alright. Like I was a I was an average student growing up in I think it was not start off high school as I really shone you know, in terms of academics, but mm -hmm. um dancing and theater so was my was my was my entire world. That's um, incredible. Yes, I, I did dancing for since I was four up until then I like did ballet exams with the Royal Academy of Dance, I took exams and stuff, um, up until I was seventeen or so. Amazing. Yeah, I, I was in modern contemporary. I was in Jamaica musical theater for years. Um, it wasn't until I got an injury that that kind of dream kind of went slack. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I did ballet, modern contemporary, a little flip hop. Um, pretty much until everything everywhere. Um, I was even the president of the UBS for a year while I was at the um, So that's the dance society at the you're right. Mm -hmm. So sorry. I mean, I told me it's like, shut up, shut up. Sure. 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 Um, so yeah, I mean, up until I was 17 years old, I was dead set on, you know, professional dance, being a professional dancer and eventually being somewhere on top of the stage. Yeah. I've always wanted to perform for said, but and life, yeah, but life went left. And so I decided, all right, since dancing isn't working out, I mean, science has always been there for me. It's always been a, it's always been, Something that came easy to me. I shouldn't say all sciences though, like physics and chemistry. No problem. I could do it in my sleep. It, it, it just made sense. Mm -hmm. Biology for me, not not so much. Um, but yeah, physics. Physics was just my thing. Um, and growing up, uh, my parents were always super supportive of anything. Mm -hmm. If I told them I wanted to be a professional whistler, they'd be like, alright, so what school we need to get you into to do this? How much money we need to allocate for that to happen and just tell us what needs to be done right. in order for you to do what you really want to do back. You know, I really appreciate my parents for kind of setting that environment for me. And it's not just my parents, I thought it was like the entire village that I had. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty close to that grandparents. Are you an only child? Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it that obvious? It's not. <laughs> Which I wanted to be sure, right? Yeah. Just to know, but but you had a lot of support, and there's that's amazing. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's that's how my family kind of goes, mm -hmm. you know. Um, if one of us doing something, and everybody is going to pop up in the one bus that my stepfather have, and we're all going to wherever whoever has right. something happening. Right. Um. So yeah, and we're 
very key topic. Mm -hmm. um, people would be like, oh, you know, you have your grandparents and your great grandparents and your great grand aunt, and that great grand aunt was a cousin and have a sister. Right. We all know them, I can Right. You know? Right. Um, so, my support system, I always had a good foundation where my support system was concerned. So, anything else I wanted to do and go off and do, like, everybody was like, all right, cool. Okay. Wait. We need to make this happen. So, yeah. So, for growing up, then, would you say, for example, extracurricular activities would take money? Um, would you say um, and, um, that it was a comfortable existence? Like, you know, there was a need in your home? What, what um, would you say about that? I, can't, I grew up in like around a middle class mm -hmm. income family. So, mm -hmm. if I wanted to do something, uh, they Nine times out of ten, it could it could be done. Mm -hmm. um, not to say that I was like a money grabbing kid, because right. um, aside from just like having a soupy paid and maybe my value paid, and it really, I mean, really, I was the type of person to really ask so much, but we were we were comfortable. Like mm -hmm. I never had to rely on transportation, like the general transportation. Like transportation. Um, uh, I think both my parents were cars. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean we were comfortable. Right. We weren't like super duper. Right, so we were, anything that was given to us, like, was fine. We made it work. Right. You know what I mean? So the reason I ask that is I'm trying to establish, you know, that for some people, one of the reasons they leave is for um, financial um, opportunities, mm -hmm. right? And lifestyle opportunities. But it wasn't like you felt I need to escape for that reason. No, no. So that's where that question was coming from. Uh, no, no, no. No, that, well, that wasn't the case mm -hmm. at all. Um, uh, probably around like the last few years before I left, mm -hmm. um, things got a little financially straining on my parents, but um, that wasn't the main reason why I left. Right. Um, it was part of the reason, maybe like ten percent, but mm -hmm. um, it wasn't me leaving in need of financial support. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. So before you left here, what was that process like? So you were at the university. You finished your first degree, mm -hmm. and you started a master's program, a field program, which is a master's of philosophy, which is research. It's mm -hmm. a research program, so not a like course heavy. You know, um, it's research. So you're doing this program, and then what comes up that makes you decide, hey, I want to leave, and why is it Japan? All right. So I set out to do my MPhil in organic LEDs. So those were the devices that I wanted. What's an LED? An LED, I like to think that. So it's a, I don't know how much science can I get into. I mean, for the average person. Sure. Okay, for the average person, um, who goes to PA Junction? <laughs> like a PA Junction diode, oh, you know, gosh. you have an A type of guitar. Like All right, yeah. okay. Um, so an LED mm -hmm. um, is really just a light emitting diode. So it's a light emitting device. Mm -hmm. Put in simple terms, you have a piece, you have, a, you have this device, right? Um, your bad voltage and it makes light. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure you're very much familiar with LEDs. It's in your TVs, it's in your general lighting. Christmas lights. Right. That's an LED, mm -hmm. really. Okay. Um, so when I say, yeah, when I say organic, um, so the LEDs that people are used to, that you see like these lights, um, and in most TVs, they are made of inorganic materials. Mm -hmm. So um, that's everything except anything that has to do with carbon, hydrogen, so basically like your silicon, your germanium, your gallium arsenide, those are inorganic semiconductor materials. Mm -hmm. The organic stuff is just a different class of materials, that's all. And you so tell she's a teacher. <laughs> she teaches people for a living. Oh, oh my gosh, I would never guess. Oh, really? <laughs> oh my god. So the, good, the organic stuff is just anything that's made from carbon, hydrogen, mm -hmm. nitrogen, oxygen. So it's just two different classes of materials that we're using okay. um, to make the LED. I okay. see, I see. Um, what's cool about the OLED, the OLED is that you can make it from solution process. Oh, but these, you need a dedicated fab lab, like a huge deposition system. It's very complicated, but for us, you can just literally make a solution. So like some powder-based compound, mix it with a solvent that's like liquid. Um, and then spin it to make a very, very thin film, and then we just stack different organic materials on top of each other and we have a film. It's not much simpler. I didn't realize it's a, yeah, it's a whole lot of chemistry. Oh, neat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's material science. 
Yeah. Which I was not digesting that. Yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure. So I studied the, I studied more of the materials that I used in those devices. Mm -hmm. um, I did a little bit of device engineering, um, but most, most for the most part, I was studying the materials that I used in those devices. Actually. And so you are studying at here at the University of Houston is in a master's program. You have an advisor. Right. So I that's what I set up to. Okay. Though I mean that research field is what I wanted to get into. Okay. Let me just give you an idea what the atmosphere for research of that field is like mm -hmm. non existent. Okay. So my here you mean like here, here, here in at the University of Houston. I see. So my mentor and my supervisor, Dr. Tanya Henry, um, she has a background, I think it's in electrical engineering. Okay. Yeah, she's, she was an engineering major. She was over by the Mona School of Engineering at the time. So she and I were like, oh, this is really cool. We should try to see what we can do to like literally create mm -hmm. a lab mm -hmm. for studying these materials and these devices. So she was supposed to be the head of device engineering, I was meant to be the material science head behind this collaboration. Now, we are literally starting from scratch. We have nothing except our will mm -hmm. and hopefully to make a way. Mm -hmm. um, so we applied for a bunch of grants, long story short, got it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think to this day, out of all the grant money that we got, we were only able to purchase one thing. Just one single thing, and that was it. In, a, in like the space of a year and a half. Um, so, so you were working, relying on this brand to give equipment to do the work, but right. you only got one thing. So you only got you weren't able to do the work. No, and we weren't was, able. We weren't able to. Uh, I mean, the funds were there for us to acquire the resources and the equipment that we needed, but red tape getting there, it just wasn't happening. Okay. You know, um, a lot of bureaucracy. Uh huh. Yeah, uh, within that program. It just it, it just did not happen. Okay, and so you're feeling how? Um, on, on top of that as well, she ended up leaving Jamaica in the middle of my program. And she was like, no worries, I can supervise you from afar. Now, I'm very fresh in the research field and there's certain things that I'm naive about. For example, having a <laughs> overseas supervisor. It's something that it's, it's not feasible. You know, for somebody who has no experience in research. Um, so I was quite frustrated in my position. Here I am, a few months into my program, and I have nothing to show for it. You know, really and truly, how am I going to get this thing done? Um, so, also, frustration more than anything else, I was honestly looking for scholarships to go elsewhere. Now, while you're doing research, I don't know if a lot of people will be familiar with the research process is before you start doing experiments and whatever, you have to read a bunch of papers to understand what's going on in your field, um, what problems are being, are, are people are trying to answer. So you can find a little niche and say, yeah, okay, this is, start. Right, this is what I'm going to focus on mm -hmm. for my research. Mm -hmm. um, in doing all of that reading, as you will, um, most of the papers that I was interested in published out of research groups in South Korea or Japan, mm. right? I mean, there are, ton there are tons of research groups that focus on OLEDs everywhere in the world, mm -hmm. but specifically the basic science was coming out of South Korea and Japan. Um, so I was like, okay, if I want to go where the experts are in my field, then mm -hmm. I need to get myself over there. So with that, I was looking up for a bunch of different scholarships I was applying everywhere, but what if I would was, for whatever I saw, um, whichever university was offering any scholarships to study with in certain universities between South Korea and Japan. Now, eventually I bought up on the MEX scholarship that was being offered from MEX? MEX, M E X T. Oh, okay. So it's a scholarship offered by the Japanese government okay. um, to any other country that they have diplomatic relationships with oh. um, for a certain amount of students based on the population of the country. To mm -hmm. come and study in Japan. Now, it's a fully funded scholarship, probably one of the best that I've ever seen. You get um, a very good stipend, like good enough to live and survive in Japan. Mm -hmm. Depending on where you live, of course, um, cost of living within Japan is variable, mm -hmm. depending on which prefecture you're in. Mm -hmm. um, but you, your tuition is fully paid. Uh, you, yeah, By prefecture, prefecture, it means. 
like in Jamaican context, it's like right. a parish. Right. So, so prefecture, it's like a state. It, prefecture is the equivalent to a parish in Jamaica. Or in the US, it would be like a state. Um, or smaller than like a county. It's small. It's it's smaller like smaller than a state. So it's like a county. Yeah. Okay. About that. About that size. Okay. Um, but it's like the major divisions in the country, pretty much. Okay. Yeah. So it's equivalent. What's what's a parish in Jamaica would be is kind of equivalent to what a state. Yeah. Would be in the US. US. So it's. The prefecture is equivalent. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, pretty much all of your needs are taken care of in order for you to just focus on your studies mm-hmm. in Japan. Mm-hmm. So I was like, this scholarship looks great. Mm-hmm. Let me just go for it. So I applied. Long story short, it's got through. Hey. Yeah. Yeah, but let's do the long story. Okay. No problem. Because no problem. there were multiple rounds of. Yeah. So, so for people who are who might be interested in going to Japan, right? It's not like you got to a and said, "Yeah, I have a passport. No, I have a this flight." Like, no. Not. What did you have to absolutely do? Absolutely not. So, oh gosh, it was so long ago. Like, not long ago. I mean, it was twenty sixteen when I started my application, and the application process for this next scholarship is about a year. So you start your applications maybe like in the summer of 2016 and you're not going to know if you're going to be going over to Japan until maybe around March of 2017 or okay. so. Yeah, so um, the first, of course the first round is you submitting the application documents and that's in, apart, I mean apart from the standard questions, you know, about your background, your educational background in particular, um, you need to write a research proposal. Mm-hmm. So you have to know what you want to go over to Japan to study. Um, mind you, they have different tiers mm-hmm. of applications. So they have the undergraduate one, they have, and they have the graduate program. Okay. Um, I applied to the graduate program, mm-hmm. and it's separated for um, MSc and PhD. Okay. Um, but before anybody goes over to Japan to begin their master's or PhD study, they all have to start with them as research students first. Okay. So. Um, for the first round, and is the goal of that to weed people out? Just like, can you really do this or not? Like, what do you think the goal of that is? Um, yeah, I, I mean, naturally. Um, but you, the first round, I don't think is to weed out people whether or not they can do it. I think it's to weed out who has the educational ability. Okay. You know what I mean? Not whether or not they can do research. Um, that comes in like the next few tiers. So. Uh, after you submit your documents um, and you go through a screening, only only like a certain set of people are called back to do an exam. The exam is just an English test and a Japanese test. You don't have to know Japanese in order to do the test. Um, okay, okay. Uh, let me explain. <laughs> so when they emailed me and told me, "All right, you've been selected for the second screening, which is just to do." An English test, you're also going to be required to do a Japanese test. Um, excuse me, I don't know any Japanese. They're like, no, it's fine, it's just a formality. This was probably the first touch for me of what life in Japan was going to be like. Um, a lot of it is, I don't want to say nonsensical, but it really is. It's almost like a facade. So you you do a test, you put your name on it, but nobody really expects it's you. It's yeah, nobody really expects you to know Japanese, but you just have to sit the test anyway. So you just do it, and they literally tell you in the examination room, just try put on something on the table. Why? Okay. Sense. All right. Fine. But so you do this test. So I do this test. Mm-hmm. Um, the English test was fine. It wasn't anything hard. The Japanese test was. I don't know what that was, but I didn't know anything. People. I was literally just choosing A, B, C, D, whatever, um, and that was it. In the third set of the screening, you know, they call back applicants for an interview. Mm-hmm. Um, so luckily, well not luckily, I was blessed enough to be called back for the third set of screening. Mm-hmm. Um, in the screening, you literally just sit down in front of a panel, mm-hmm. um, and they're meant to interview you about your research proposal. A lot of the questions that I got in that panel had probably only one person asked me something about my research proposal. So, so yeah, got through the interview. Um, after that, it was a few months later, like a, about maybe four or five months later, 
um, that I got an email saying that I passed that screening. No, I need to contact professors that I want to study in Japan. Um, so basically, me just looking through, looking back through the papers and seeing which professors um, are publishing actively in whichever field that I'm that I want to go into for studying OLEDs, um, and just directly contacting them um, just via simple email. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you have to contact around three. Um, and among that three was my perfect, my, would be my future professor, Professor Heiki Murakba, and it's really hard to pronounce his first name. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I, he was very kind enough um, to accept me as a research student. And of course, as a MEC scholar, um, professors do want to accept these students because they come with funding. Mm. Yeah, fully funded tuition, and I think their labs also get an incentive, a monetary incentive. That's at these students as well. Nice. Um, so after all of that was done, because that's a screening in of itself. If you don't get accepted by at yes, least nobody wants to like exactly, then it, it makes no it makes no sense. Mm -hmm. um, so if you don't get at least three professors to accept you as a research student to go into the university, then you kind of drop off. So um, after that, that was pretty much a final screening. So you are now at the point where you've been accepted mm -hmm. and you. Um, your what was your another step up? So, was there another step after you got accepted by this person? Uh, no, after you get accepted, it's pre you pretty much just have to leave on a call from the embassy to say, okay, we're definitely going to be sending you another scholar. Right. Nice. So it was only myself and another girl, just two people that offer that year from Jamaica, from Jamaica for graduate study. So. Wait, you said it wasn't just Jamaica. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm getting okay. into that now. Okay. So for the graduate program, um, they choose only two students mm -hmm. out of three countries, out of Jamaica, Bahamas, and Belize. So it was two Jamaicans. So it was the Hunger Games. Games. Oh. <laughs> it was the Hunger Games, and you were at Miss Everdeen. Oh, man, except I wasn't killing children. Oh, yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, we're just knocking them out of the way. Oh, right. <laughs> but yeah, it was just two of us out of three countries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pretty neat. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty neat. So, yeah. So we got it. We got it. We got it. So, Bam, we went to Japan. What do you need so, to? Do? What do you need to do to prepare? What's the mindset at this point? Honestly, for me at that age, um, I think I was just so ready to get out and start my research career. Mm. I was just so gumbo over the fact that first of all, I'm going to be traveling to Japan, mm -hmm. um, and I'm actually going to get to do my research. I'm actually mm -hmm. going to be in a in a space with, with other people that are studying the same devices, you know, I mean, we're, I'm going to be presenting at talks, I'm going to be, you know, in the lab, in my experiment. Oh, I feel so, like, I feel, like, I feel the feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, it's only, oh. My, right? my brain was on nothing but this excitement of mm -hmm. getting over there. Oh I think in my, you know, in my naivety, mm -hmm. I was not prepared socially for what I was going to be coming up against. Mm -hmm. In my mind, it's just like traveling to the US. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask a trip. It's, a, it's just a trip. It's just a, it's a vacation. Right. You know what I mean? Um, I, was, I really wasn't prepared for uh, adjusting mm -hmm. to, the, to the completely different, to a completely different culture. Because when you, when you look up YouTube videos, you know, how to get around in Japan, they're, mm -hmm. they're talking in English. The people that they're talking, the Japanese people that they're talking to are speaking back to them in English, you know. Uh, they're just going about their lives like we do here, going to the supermarket, going on a train, traveling around. It's fantastical, you know. It gave me a very false sense, at least the videos I watched at the time, it gave me a very false sense of what I was going to be booking up um, before I went to Japan. All I, all I thought I really need to know was how to say good morning, excuse me, and thank you. Mm -hmm. Like that was my extent. That that was the extent of my vocabulary before I went to Japan. Reaching there though, mm -hmm. landing in Osaka. How long is the flight? By the way, did you leave from Kingston? Ah, um. Okay. So, uh, the f the itinerary took me from what was it? Was it LA? Kingston? No, I don't think I went directly to LA. If my memory serves me correctly, Kingston to maybe Miami, Miami to LA. LA to Osaka. Mm. Um, I mean, Kingston to Miami, everybody knows that. Miami to LA, 
That's how Which is still a That's wrong. Wrong. It's it's wrong. Wrong. But it's still in the US. It's still in the US. LA? Yeah. To Osaka? Yeah. How long is that? See, it was like 12, 13 hours. That's wild. Mind you, my longest flight up until that point in life has not been more than maybe like four or five hours. That's what, like, New York from Kingston? Yeah, I think it was from Kingston to New York. Yeah, when I was very young, too. Like, yeah. I can't really remember any of it. Right. But, uh, girl? That's well, real. it was an experience. And I remember getting sick on the plane to come oh. Yeah, that was wild. But anyway. So it starts because I know with people who go to Asian countries, the water is different, the food is different. And everything then it's is, everything is your different. digestive system literally has to. And, I, and, and the thing is, calibrate. I'm a person, I don't, I don't realize how... Mm. The physiology of my body reacts to things before I can even process it myself. Mm. So I'm in my mind, I'm excited and whatever, but my body is losing it. Mm-hmm. Like I, 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 I mean, my stomach was going wild on on the plane. I wasn't keeping anything down. Why? Why? Why am I reacting like this when I'm mm-hmm. normally a human garbage bin? I can't process anything. Like I normally have a very strong constitution. Mm-hmm. My body was losing it on the plane. Like I didn't even realize I was nervous for this mm. for this entire life change. It was hitting me and physically on the plane. Yeah, before I mentally you're not there yet. No, mentally I was just too excited. Mm-hmm. I was focused on something totally different, and my body was like, "This mm-hmm. is hold up, hold up, right? hold up." <laughs> so that was my first touch with reality. And actually, I was very I, I appreciate having um, her name was Shawnee. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Shawnee or Shawnee. The other person? The other person. Oh, you went on the same flight? Yeah, man. We we did everything together. So our from Kingston to straight to Osaka, we were together. We even stayed in the same hotel and stuff. Yeah. So um, landed in Osaka. Oh my God, it's so pretty. Trees. Wow, it's so clean. (laughs) Everybody's so nice. On a plane. Sure. Yeah, on a plane. But um. We we luckily landed at a very tranquil hour. Okay. So the rush hour thing wasn't hitting us like that. Um, actually, the transition up until I went, I got myself to my university, which was like about two hours away from Osaka. By train or by train. Okay. That was my first time taking the train. I was so lost. Mm-hmm. Um, YouTube videos didn't prepare me well enough. I was just like, I got this. I know this. I'm an, I'm a I'm a global citizen. Right. I can do anything. Right. Could I? What would it, what should have just been like a two hour transit took me about three and a half hours. Mm-hmm. Missed my train, got on the wrong one, went on one in the opposite direction and needed to go back. I was just, I was like, I can't, I right. can't do, I can't do this. Right. But I had to take the train and I would take it to take it where you were going. And at this point, you separated because she's going somewhere else. She's going somewhere to a totally different. Gotcha. Um, and I think she went by coach. Gotcha. So I probably should have done that too. So I was like, nah, I'll just take the train. I'm good. So you made it. I made it. I made it. You made it. It took you a little while, but you made it. <laughs> okay. I'm there. So what's that like? What's the adjustment like? You are now a Jamaican in Japan. What does that mm-hmm. feel like for you? What does? Are you chopstick savvy? Are you? Um, is the water different? Like, are you? What are you eating? Um, I'll tell you what. Uh, I already plan to try and be as open-minded as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, the water didn't face me. Okay. The food didn't face me. I love all different types of food. Um, I come from a traditional Chinese family, so okay. I was very versed in chopsticks from long then. Okay. Uh, so it wasn't, it wasn't a big deal. What really um, was kind of like my first culture shock was just the level of respect that mm-hmm. I need to outward issues and how reserved other people are in greetings. Here, um, for us to hug somebody is no big deal. I remember when I was being introduced to my lab mates and I, I tried to go in for a hug. I was like, hi, how are you, you know? And they literally reared back and it said, you know, nice to meet you, and they, they bowed. I was right. like, oh damn, I'm sorry. So that that physical uh, are you reject sensitive? Huh? Are you reject sensitive? A little bit, a little bit. But I, 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 didn't, I, didn't, I didn't, I didn't, take it personally. You didn't take no, no. You, you don't take it personally when you're rejected mm-hmm. sensitive. You don't even like your first instinct is you just feel bad. Um, 
So it's not so bad for you. It's, it wasn't that bad. Oh, like I, I knew, I, I knew. Okay, this is. I knew the reason why. Once I can rationalize something, okay. there's no reason for me to feel. I can, gotcha. I can rationalize myself out of a bad or a good feeling. Yes. You understand? Makes sense. So I was like, okay. This Some is, people pack. No, no, no. I don't. Because <laughs> I had imagined for someone like that, it would be really hard in a place like Japan, right. especially where you're coming from, a very expressive culture. Exactly, mm-hmm. and we're very, we're very physical. Yeah, you know uh, that physical expression for yeah. us, and yeah. just like being outrightly saying what's on our mind. It's, yeah. it's, it's very we're colorful, right? But Japan is on the completely opposite spectrum. Right. So all of a sudden, I can't outrightly say what it is I'm thinking. Mm-hmm. Um, it takes people by shock and by seems almost taboo. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't physically just touch you, you know, just if I'm laughing or whatever, you know, sometimes you can just laugh and you kind of like yeah. push people, yeah. no, that's, that's not okay, mm-hmm. um, I have to be very sensitive about what I'm saying and how I say it, um, because it may come off, easily come off as me disrespectful. I just had a realization, I had a question, so physical touch, mm-hmm. you can be starved of physical touch. Do you feel like you experienced that when you were there? Because if you, I mean, you would have had international friends. I'm mm-hmm. that because you went to university, so yeah. it was like 55% international. Right. But I, I guess it wouldn't have been that bad. But if you're in a society where we laugh, I would like push the person, yeah. right? And, yeah. Or we hug sometimes. Or we sit and it's not weird if your knee touches. Did you feel like it got as bad as like deprivation of some sort, some of the social interaction that you're used to? Or not um, really? I must say that probably my international friends kind of cushioned that for me. So okay. where if I didn't have them, I definitely would have been probably in a corner just holding myself or being mm-hmm. starved. Mm-hmm. Um, that that kind of ease of interaction in general. Mm-hmm. Um, not to say that Japan is it's like stifling, um, but for somebody coming from a very expressive culture, to some degree, that's just how they've been. That's just how they operate. They express themselves very, very differently from how we do. You are studying for six months. You're doing research for six months. Yeah. What's that six month um, uh, adjustment? Yeah. What's that like? You're doing research is also an adjustment culturally, socially. What is that? Right. Like? So you kind of have to make sure that you balance your academic life and your own personal life. Um, luckily. The research program is not, the research period is not as demanding, meaning you're not expected to generate a whole lot of results. Pretty much just do your literature review and every week or so you review your papers and you submit your reports on whatever you've done so far, there's no pressure. Um, in that period, academically, you're expected to prepare for your examination to actually matriculate into the graduate graduate program. So it's like a qualifying exam. Right. So you're expected to do research and then at the end of that six months period you have to do an examination to get into the oh, so the qualifying exam before you go into the program? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so you don't yeah. just, you don't just get accepted by the, by the, by your professor at the university and they're like, hey all right, ready to go do research. <laughs> no, you have to do an exam. That's smart because usually, right? Because he and that was just the way to the masters, which is the top right. masters. Mm-hmm. But usually, it's like you do the masters program and you start, and then you figure out. But that's smart. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. So, um, mind you, the MSc program in Japan is usually like about thirty to forty percent top classes. The rest of it is your research. So at the end, you're expected to produce like a good thesis, mm-hmm. and you have to defend your thesis. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, uh, the first six months socially uh, was actually a trip for me. Mm-hmm. Um, it was it was a nice learning experience. Mm-hmm. Um, apart from having to deal with some really big culture shocks and just learning how to adjust yourself to life in Japan in the countryside, I might add, um, it wasn't as bad for me because um, I was. Uh, at my university campus, it, it gives you a good mm-hmm. international kind of feel within a Japanese society. So it's kind of cushioned with all right, learning from a lot of other people while you all try to adjust yourself to Japanese lifestyle. Um, so little things like what your lunch would look like, because typically people would eat in the cafeteria. Um, that mainly looks like a lot of fish. 
a lot of fried stuff, which people would probably free people up. Like tempura? Not just tempura, but, but, other, types but other, other types of fried food as well. People think, oh, they just eat a lot of boiled food and lots of soups. No, man. Them love them oil. Full of or is oil. it because it's a college campus? No, no, no. It's no. culturally. It's it culturally. You will book up on a lot of oh, just That's okay. fine. Please edit that out. It's fine. Um, you might see. Yeah. And so, if they do, it's normal. Um, in a typical Japanese restaurant, you can be offered like a host of different fried stuff. Got you. Yeah. From chicken, they eat everything. So yeah. chicken, pork, beef, fish, mm-hmm. all types of fish too. Um, even. What's it called? I don't remember the name. I don't remember how to pronounce it. I had it once and it made me sick. Um, sperm from whale? male fish. Oh, okay. Is it, was it from a whale? I can't remember if it was male But anyway, yeah. it's literal sperm oh. from fish that's deep fried. Oh, neat. No. I mean, not neat for me to try, it, but it, I it did looks, not know it looks, it looks like a curd yeah, and they literally yeah. just fry it up and serve it to you in like a block. It tastes good enough, but my stomach was just like, no, this is not for you, babe. And I was quite, I was quite experimental where my food was concerned so, as well. So like the raw fish, yeah, man, give me that. I want to try it. Um, I didn't like it at first, but it slowly grew on me. Mm-hmm. Um, you're going to have to rely on a lot of fish and stuff if you're going to be living in Japan. Vegetarians have a very hard time. I had a lot of uh, Indian friends and they could only go to specific shops. Um, especially at specific Indian shops to get the kind of food that they yeah, need to get the kind of food that they need because Japanese people don't eat. So do you feel like your being adventurous allowed you to adjust a little bit better? I think so, yeah. Um, I was very willing to try mm-hmm. different things. Yeah, I can already see how I would have failed because <laughs> I'm not no, I'm not eating like it's not even a, like if it just looks and it's a texture thing, like if it just looks too soft, I'm not gonna Really? You that if I smell a certain thing I'm wow. not. And it's not even like I might I might try it and not enjoy it, but I'm not that person. So I, I already see how I just would not have survived. Yeah, I mean, I know and the snacks were not real quick, right? I, I must say like for the first maybe few days or weeks I was just like, Oh god, I don't know if I can do this but there was a point in my life where something kind of clicked that this is you need to stop fighting certain things and start going with the flow. Okay. Um, so I had a very grown up conversation with myself like about like a few days in because I was just like, if I keep doing this, if I keep comparing life in Japan to Jamaica, I will never survive here. I will end up in. That's a word. Yeah.